we'll start letting everybody in. Keep tabs on some stuff. Give everybody a few minutes while you're setting up your audio and your video and grabbing yourself a bit of water or settling in. We'll get started in just a few minutes. I'll give everybody a chance to get logged in and set up. We'll give everybody just a minute. We should be good. Give everybody just another minute in case everybody's signing on just at the top of the hour. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, I believe this is all being recorded. So if you didn't get a chance to jump in right at the beginning, you'll be able to have access to it, I believe, later. Um, and I'd like to, before we get started, I'd like to thank Sumedica for, for putting this all together. Um, and I don't know if the slide's going to show up at the end because I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties. But to my understanding, you'll all be getting a promo code for a 15% discount on a CC stuff from Zumedica um, for attending this. So that'll come out later. Um, and I see some familiar names in the participants uh, window. So it's nice to see some awesome folks and for everybody taking uh, time out of their busy schedules to attend, whether in person or live. Um, <clears throat> my name is Matt Brunke. I am a sports medicine and rehabilitation specialist just outside of Washington, DC. Um, I am not a neurologist, but I'm here to kind of cover an overview of common neurological conditions in veterinary rehab and how do we can target a treatment. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, I will answer Q&A and stuff at the end of everything. Um, and you'll have my direct email in here as well if you come up with questions later on. So... We're going to skip a little bit about me or really just condense it. Um, I practice at Veterinary Referral Associates in Gaithersburg, Maryland.
Maryland, just inside the Beltway. Um, I've been a veterinarian for almost 20 years now, um, and I cover a wide range of rehabilitation, acupuncture, pain management, and then since I'm a sadist, I went back after 10 years of being out in GP and ER world and went back and did a residency in sports med and have been boarded now for five years. So a couple of quick disclaimers. I work with a lot of our industry partners, um, including the folks up at the Penn Vet Working Dog Center, obviously Zoomedica and Assisi. And I'm also faculty for a brand new rehabilitation course the CCAT course out of NC State. Um, if anybody has questions on learning more about rehab, please reach out to me. Happy to pay it forward for everybody that's answered all my questions over the years. We're gonna try to cover neuro in an hour. Um, so what do we, how do we do that? Let's just jump right into it. Um, this is one that I'm not gonna hit every word and every bullet point in this slide. This is just a review of definitions, okay? Um, I've got a full neuroanatomy lecture. If anybody wants that, I'm happy to send the PDF of those slides to it as well. Uh, but these are just some terms that if you're not doing neuro all the time or neuro rehab, you have to start thinking and expanding your vocabulary a bit so you understand the lingo about what folks are talking about. Most of you are probably familiar with all of these. The three that I want you to focus on, and I see you, Patty Nolan, I know you know these, is neuropraxia, axonotmesis, and neurotmesis. These are things that we need a neurologist to confirm on for us with MRI and EMG. But if you get a definite uh, diagnosis of neurotmesis, you have to have a heart-to-heart -heart with these owners about function because that nerve is totally severed, okay? So you really got to understand what neuro is talking about because that's going to help us understand what went wrong, and what are our chances of making it better? Remember that the spinal cord begins at the caudal extent of the medulla oblongata and continues all the way to the lumbar region, and then we have our cauda equina. Right? Skeletal-wise, we have seven cervical vertebrae, 13 thoracic, seven lumbar, three sacral vertebrae all fused into one, and anywhere from none to 20 caudal vertebrae making up the tail. Um, we'll talk about LS disease, but it's always important to know your normals before you know your abnormals. So if you have a dog who has eight lumbar vertebrae, right, that dog has a higher chance for LS disease just because the structural changes of the body. So counting, making sure you have your right things, getting a good understanding of what's going on is critically important. The spinal cord itself, we break it down into sections. Cervical, C1 to C5. Cervical intumescence, that C6, T2, or T3, L3 range. And our L4, S3 range, which technically we can break down into upper and lower, L4 to L6 and L6 to S3. And just remember, we have two basic neurons. We have upper motor neurons, which go from the brain to the white matter. And we have lower motor neurons from the gray matter to the target tissue. From a rehab perspective, not as a sports medicine specialist, but as a rehabilitation practitioner, right? what are we looking at? And those practitioners can be physical therapists, technicians, doctors. Right? You may not be able to make a diagnosis in your state, but you should still be able to do an exam and an assessment. That includes visual, just watch the dog stand, or the cat. Right? Watch it walk. How do you do your standing and recumbent evaluations? And remember that just because they come in for neuro doesn't mean it's always neuro. Um, so check your cardiovascular, your orthopedic, and your neuro systems. We get a lot of mimics. If dogs that tear both cruciates on the same day, it's going to come in through neuro as a down dog. Right? Start to just make some notes, look at it and go, which limb or limbs are affected? Is this something where we have some delays? Does it look drunk? Is it only the back legs that look drunk? What's going on? Just start to do a complete understanding of these dogs and cats so you have an understanding of what's going on. When we break that down into upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, grab a screenshot of this, okay? 
This is the cheat sheet, right? The gait, the postural reactions, the spinal reflexes, the muscle tone and muscle atrophy are going to differ depending on upper motor neuron versus lower. This is the cheat sheet, okay? You do your tests, you go back and go, well, he doesn't have atrophy, he, the muscle tone's increased, and the spinal reflexes are normal. Uh, that dog's an upper motor neuron lesion, okay? Now you just have to figure out which legs are affected and it's gonna tell you where the lesion should be. And notice I keep saying lesion because we're not sure yet if it's a disc or a tumor or what. From that, you then get your anatomic diagnosis, okay? So if you have upper motor neuron signs to all four limbs, it is a C1 to C5 lesion. You now know where the pain should be. Now you can go back and look at the neck. If your thoracic limbs are normal, then you know it's gotta be no higher than a T3, L3. And now you figure out, well, if the front legs are normal, but it's lower motor neuron signs in the pelvic limb, it's an L4, S3, right? You've isolated. Now you start to think about what things within L4, S3 region can cause the things you're seeing. So you go from an anatomic diagnosis to a differential diagnosis. This is another fun one out of one of the textbooks that I think is always a good one to grab a screenshot of. Um, starts to break it down by motor function, sensory function, proprioceptive and somatic influences. So this is always a great one, right? If anybody's looking, by the way, I forgot to include a picture of it. If anybody's ever looking for like a slam dunk neuro textbook, the Curtis Dewey and Ronaldo da Costa textbook is on its fourth or fifth edition. And it's amazing. Okay, you can get it on Kindle. I don't get any rewards or, or kickbacks from it, but it is an awesome, awesome textbook. And most of the image you'll see here, I plucked from those folks' work. So when you're doing your rehab assessment of a neuro patient, T3 is the key, okay? Because if the forelimbs are normal and the hind limbs are abnormal, it has to be at least a T3 lesion. If both the forelimbs and the hind limbs are abnormal, it has to be cranial to T3. And yeah, I get it that the way to kind of consider these is, well, it's neuro, let's send it through the ER, let's call up our neurologist. Are you up for a $5,000 neuro consult and MRI? A lot of our clients and patients are not. So we'll talk about this at the end too. If you have a dog and or a cat, get some radiographs, okay? If you can work in it, if you're in primary care, go to your veterinarian, if you're the veterinarian, okay? You can do a neuro exam and go, yeah, MRIs are ideal, but if that's not going to happen, we can still get a decent workup and start to eliminate or work our way into what this diagnosis is. The exception is what's called shift Sherrington syndrome. This is a severe acute lesion to the thoracolumbar segments. Um, and when you put the patient in lateral, they'll get increased tone to the forelimbs. So it'll look like a neck, but it's not a neck. And this is a little step up, but this is, you look at this dachshund and you're like, uh, he blew a disc in his neck. No, he actually blew a disc so badly, T3 to L3 region, that he's just stiff and uncomfortable. So it's not a neck. You want to get films of the T3 through L3 region and skip the cervical here. Remember that spinal cord dysfunction works in a in a step-by-step -step pathway. You get pain first. Sometimes you don't see pain. It's so subacute, you just go straight to motor function loss. But you can get pain showing up first, which is also known as root signature. Proprioceptive loss follows, then ambulation capabilities, then motor function, and then the ability to perceive pain. And of course, you get them back in reverse order. You can grade those, numerically we grade them zero to four or normal, mild, moderate, severe. If you've done your rehab assessment, what's the cause, okay? And I'm old enough now, we got taught it was DAMIT V teaches you everything. I think the new acronym is vitamin D, okay? 
but this is what causes everything. Doesn't matter if it's neuro, ortho, IMED, anything, okay? When in doubt, draw out, damn it, V, and start going, did we test for these things, okay? What I wanna do now is walk through all these letters of the alphabet here and the different diseases we can see in both the CNS and the PNS, and then we're gonna talk about how to treat. So CNS system within the spinal cord, here's what I would consider the top six degenerative conditions we see commonly in vet med, specifically in vet rehab. So let's take a peek at each one really briefly. Our A luxes. Typically, signalment's going to be toy to small breed dogs. CKCS, by the way, is Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Okay. These kids are acute or progressive neck pain to weakness. And because they are a neck and they're high cervical, they are C1, C5. So all four limbs are affected. The way to really get these is to get them to surgery because they need stabilization. Sometimes you can put them in a neck cast. But if a Yorkie comes in looking down like this and it's really stiff in its front legs, do not make it look up. Because what you will do is see what this arrow is, okay? This is an AA Lux. If you make that dog look up, you will drive its dens and its vertebrae into its spinal cord and you can terminate them, okay? You can make them paralyzed for life where they're just painful. Okay? So be very delicate with these little dogs with neck pain. Wobbler's disease, also known as cervical spondylomyelopathy or cervical malformation malarticulation syndrome. Typically young Great Danes, young Mastiffs and Marathis, middle-aged to older Dobermans. And this is the great imitator. It can be high cervical. It can be low cervical. It can lateralize and only take out the left side. It could take out just the right side. It could take out a little mix of everything. But I want you to appreciate if you're not used to looking at MRI, okay? Look at the areas where this spinal cord is impinged. You guys should all be able to see, right? This spot here is the worst, but this dog's got changes throughout its cervical cord. And this Doberman is miserable, okay? This Doberman is staring at the ground because the moment it tries to raise its head up, it screams in pain, okay? So when you, you see a dog like this on assessment and you try to like, hey bud, look up, or you try to tempt him with peanut butter and they don't look up, start being really careful about a neck lesion, small dog or big dog. Common intervertebral disc disease breaks down into three types. Type one, Typically, we think about our dachshunds and our chondrodystrophics, like our Frenchies, okay? This is a disc extrusion because the nucleus and the annulus rupture. They're typically chondrodystrophic, small breed, greater than two years. There was even a study, by the way, Dr. Marcel and Little out of UC Davis um, was able to look at a litter of puppies that unfortunately passed away during being born. Um, all of the dogs in the litter had changes for cervical disc disease before they even took a breath of life. Right? We have bred this in in the last couple of years. Um, there's a study on that, um, that they're born this way. We have even now identified the UC Davis team has done a really nice job, unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately. They've even identified the genes now that cause this or a component of this, okay? So we've, we've made this. Um, it may not show up till two or three years of age or five or six or seven, but we've made this. That dog typically is a T3L3 lesion, right? They're rapid in onset. That's where they usually show up. They can show up cervical, but this is what it looks like in cross section, the nucleus and the annulus rupture, and it blows up and pushes on the cord, which is living here. Okay, that T3L3 dog, when it does that, his their neck and thoracic limbs are fine, but this dog walks in dragging itself, right? It looks like it's got bad anal glands because this posture is almost pathognomonic for a type one invertebral disc disease. Some of them will respond to meds, some of them surgery, ideally imaging, advanced imaging, CT myelogram or MRI or where we want to go. 
Just a few pointers here. If they're deep pain positive, medical management alone gives us a 50% chance of getting back to walking. Walking is not perfect walking, but is walking. Deep pain negative and medical management, about a five to 10% success rate. If you get those dogs to surgery, okay, look at how the rates change. Now that is not overnight, it's an eight to 16 week recovery, but you double your odds if they're deep pain positive, okay? And you almost tenfold increase your odds if they're deep pain negative by getting these dogs to surgery. This dog, okay? Um, this is Max, who was an acute disc extrusion, because normally we say they're chondrodystrophic, but Max fell down the side of a mountain in the Adirondacks. Uh, this was my colleague, Dr. Todd Bishop, um, operated on this dog. Um, he herniated disc dorsally. Notice that we didn't do a ventral, he didn't do a ventral slot. This was a dorsal laminectomy because the way the disc blew, okay? And this dog was down for a while. He unfortunately developed aspiration pneumonia after surgery. He was on oxygen, okay? Um, but look at this dog a week later, okay? Well, rehab goes a long way. This dog's up and outside. Okay, so this was less than two weeks post-surgery here on the left on the treadmill and three weeks later, uh, three weeks post-surgery, sorry. If we think about our typical type two disc disease, Hansen type two, that's a disc protrusion. So the annulus bulges because the nu and the nucleus follows along and it slowly impinges, okay? And these are the ones that kind of equate a little bit to falling asleep on your arm and waking up with that pins and needles feeling. It's slowly bulging. They can start to cause some issues. They usually don't have horrible changes, but they can, but they can really be uncomfortable. And that's what this will look like on um, advanced imaging, okay? They usually are gonna respond well to medical management, but surgery can be an option if needed. And then there's our Hansen type three, also known as our ANNPE or acute non-compressive nucleus pulposus extrusion. Okay, if you think about an intervertebral disc like a jelly donut, the annulus is the crust and the nucleus is the jelly, okay? What happens with this is a piece of the nucleus goes rogue, it breaks off and it shoots straight up through the annulus and dings the cord. It's also known in fancy terms as a high velocity, low volume disc extrusion. I like a jelly donut analogy more. This will look almost like an FCE in its presentation in that it's acute. They'll be really painful and then they won't be. And this is non-surgical. Interestingly though, dogs with an ANNPE were significantly older at their onset um, than dogs with an FCE. We'll get to FCEs in just a minute. Um, so they can be usually have a, a little more hyperesthetic for ANNPEs. Um, usually have a lesion at C1 to C5 as opposed to other areas, and they usually have a good chance to be ambulatory at discharge. What that looks like, by the way, on MRI is here, okay? You get this, you don't get a lot of disc material up in the, um, if you looked at the axials, you wouldn't get as much disc material up, but look at this cord essentially being bruised. You get a focal intramedullary lesion, a little haziness, because this cord took a ding straight to itself. But what about good old fashioned spondylosis deformans, okay? This is another degenerative condition, right? So here's plain films, dogs in lateral, heads to the left, spinal cords living here and we don't see it. This disc space looks pretty good. This one's got some spondylosis. This one's got some spondylosis. Ventrally, this one's got some bridging spondylosis. This, 25 to 70% of nine-year-old dogs are affected according to a study, especially boxers. And interestingly enough, it's usually not clinical. We don't see conscious proprioceptive deficits, spinal pain, et cetera. Now, this is a little bit of a misnomer here because this, which we'll get to in a minute, one of my favorite neurodiseases of all time, LS disease, this could be a hot mess and cause L4S3 changes. But these changes here in the T3L3 segment, if the dog doesn't have T3L3 signs, this is a red herring. This, though, we could look at. 
when you progr not progress, but things that look like just plain spondylosis, you can get DISH. So DISH is diffuse in idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. It may be non-clinical. It may cause some degree of spinal pain, but it is diffuse, okay? And you take films, if I brought up the chest films on this dog, okay? This dog would have um, hyperostosis all the way up through C1, okay? I just pulled this just to show this is completely fused. But look at the disc spaces. They're not collapsed. They're not mineralized, okay? And we don't know what the cord looks like on plain films. We would need some advanced imaging. What about DM? DM we see a lot of in rehab. By the way, DM in my world is degenerative myelopathy. I fully agree that in the ECC and IMED world, DM is diabetes mellitus, but that's not why we're here, okay? Um, top breeds, German Shepherds, Pembrokes, not Cardigans. Boxers, Rhodesians, and others. It's a degeneration of the axons and the myelin. They are usually older than eight years old, usually non-painful, and usually T3 through L3 disease. There's a genetic test through University of Missouri and UC Davis's vet schools. And there's some, we haven't done a lot with DM in a long time, but I think there's some new stuff coming up the pipeline. Uh, Cornell with uh, Curtis Dewey and Philippa Johnson did a study on MRI just a, about a year or two ago that with some of the new MRI capabilities, we can now start to pick up changes in the spinal cord. Because before, the only way to definitively say it was DM was positive DM test, negative MRI, negative spinal tap, and then a positive change on necropsy. That's not really practical, right? New research, DTI imaging with a 3T MRI could be really helpful in picking up changes on the cord. What did we have for rehab-oriented DM stuff? This is an old paper now, 17 years old, at a JVIM, it's open access. It said dogs with DM that went through rehab lived longer. My hard part with this is folks that wanna do rehab oftentimes you have to remember that DM is usually not fatal. So owners that are more in, emotionally invested may keep going and don't elect euthanasia. But there's some evidence here that rehab helps. Where DM can really get nasty is when it progresses high enough up to, towards T3, T4, and it starts to knock out the phrenic nerve. Your phrenic nerve is your innervation for your diaphragm and to some degree your intercostals and the other nerves up there. So what can really unfortunately happen with DM cases is that they will suffocate to death because they have paralysis of their respiratory muscles. This is what that shepherd looks like. Every one of us has seen a DM shepherd in our life and if you're not, we'll see a lot more, okay? This dog can't stand in its rear end. It has no pain at all up and down its entire spine. Um, and if you did an MRI, it would be entirely normal, and it would be double positive for the gene. Moving on to things that will sometimes get confused with DM. My favorite neuro disease of all time, lumbosacral disease. Some of you may have low back pain, okay? You might have sciatica yourselves or your family members might. This is the exact same thing. We see it a lot in German Shepherds, Malinois but I've seen it in Labradors, Dalmatians, Greyhounds, you name it, I've seen it. They have back pain and they have lameness sometimes because they get root signature of the uh, lumbar intumescence. The thing here is if you can rule out infection and neoplasia, my favorite way to treat these is with epidural steroids because we have studies that show 79% of cases can be comfortable for one to four years after an epidural steroid series. And for me, being especially in the DC area, this is heart, very close to my heart because this is the number one reason why any military working dog, MWD, is retired early. Not only in the US, Israel, New Zealand, Germany, all of the countries battle the same thing. So if we can work on low back pain in our dogs, we can keep them working and comfortable and doing all their wonderful jobs that they're designed to do. This is also known as caudi equina syndrome because Latin for horse's rear end, okay? You'll get a, a bulge here in the disc, a chronic type two bulge. You can get compression here. 
On the axials, you'll also see that you can get facet changes. You can get other changes. There's eight or 10 different pathophysiologies of LS disease that kind of get lumped in. But you can see here on this side, you don't see the sciatic nerve tract. And on this side, you do. Okay. Other, moving on from degenerative, we move into anomalous or congenital. You can get spina bifida. It's an incomplete fusion of the dorsal vertebral arches, usually in the LS area. Interestingly, these are the breeds that we usually see, including our cats. And then hemivertebrae, right? These butterfly vertebrae, these things that just look weird. We were going to see these for the next 15 years because Frenchies just became the number one breed in the AKC. Okay, so they are a mess. They can cause all sorts of cord compression. You can appreciate that this dog's spinal cord is nowhere near normal, okay? Now that you see the cord, but what is this cord traveling through? It's sigmoid already. Neoplastic conditions that can cause any of our spinal cord signs. Extra durals are just that. They're outside the dura matter, but they're still compressing. They can be both primary or metastatic. Intradural extramedullary are usually meningiomas. So they're growing inside the dura, okay, but outside the medullary part by their name, and they're still compressing the cord. And intramedullary are the rarest of the three, but you can get pure cord cancer, essentially. Those dogs will all look fairly similar. You really need an MRI to confirm. This dog is a C1 to C5 and a modified uh, quad cart just trying to get them out and move. Osseous neoplasia can also occur. So if, you can't, if the owner can't afford to go for an MRI, take films, okay? You can still rule out things like primary osteosarcoma, metastasis, other things, right? Look at all these lytic lesions here, okay? In this lumbar vertebrae, this is not normal, okay? These dogs are painful. This vertebrae is eating away. You may get a pathologic fracture. Okay, you can start to really look for these just with plain films. Infectious and inflammatory causes. These are some of the big ones. Okay, disco, right, is an inflammation and infection between the end plates. Um, radiographs can be helpful. CT or MRI is ideal. Um, you need blood and urine cultures, ideally. It's usually a staph species, but it can be anything. So you have to get urine samples and all sorts of stuff. It's months to years of antibiotics. There's a paper in 2005 out of JAFMA. If anybody needs it, just send me a memo and I'll send it to you. It showed that the median survival time out of LSU's vet school, the median survival, sorry, the median time of being on antibiotics for discospondylitis out of LSU's vet school in 2005 JAFMA paper was 53.7 weeks over a year of antibiotics in order to resolve their issues, if they could do that. Rickettsial, guess living out west, I'm actually flying out to Colorado tomorrow to go teach. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, right? Big one out there. It still causes spinal cord signs just like anything else can. Benefit is we can usually respond to antibiotics. Fungal infections, for those of you that live in those affected areas, cryptococcus, blasto, histo, Okay, all have varying degrees of capabilities of where they're going to affect the body and how they're going to recover. But we as rehab folks still need to help them in that recovery while they're on their other therapies. Protozoals, usually puppies and kittens, Neospora and Toxo being the top two. Toxo responds really nicely, usually to clindamycin. Okay, puppies, puppies and Neospora is a guarded prognosis and it sucks. Um, they can really have some significant changes with these. They can be decent on antibiotics and extensive physical therapy, but they are commitments for sure. Parasitic causes of spinal cord diseases, raccoon roundworms and heartworm and cuterebra, okay? These can cause what's called verminous meningioencephalitis. It is nasty, okay? Um, there is a larval migraine, right? Going through, that is horrible. It's usually a grave prognosis. They're rare, but you may see them. Inflammatory idiopathic stuff. This is our GMEs or granulomatous meningioencephalomyelitis. 
Worldwide in dogs, we don't know why. Female small breed dogs are at higher risk. This is a nasty thing. Um, it's an uncertain prognosis. We try to put it on creds. Some of them get better, some of them don't. We try to throw other immunomodulatory drugs at them. Some of them help, some of them don't. Rehab can be helpful, but it is variable with these dogs. Spinal cord fractures, whether you're attending in the US where it's an HBC or hit by car, RTA is called road traffic accident for those of you British or Australian trained. Um, fractures can happen from being hit by a vehicle, right? But you can also get pathologic fractures from nutritional disorders or neoplasia. And again, fractures show up on films. So if something doesn't feel right, take some films. This dog, um, this dog was shot in the neck with a scoped rifle by the owner's neighbor because they thought, looking through the scoped rifle, that the dog looked like a fox. I question that owner's eyes, that neighbor's eyesight. I never questioned the owner. This dog did remarkably well. It had a 14-hour surgery putting its cervical spinal, uh, cervical spinal column back together at Cornell years ago. And this was my first neuro case ever once I was certified in rehab. Thankfully, I had two amazing LVTs who did all the real work, but we put this dog back together and she walked for years. It was really comfortable. Vascular conditions of the spinal cord. This is where we kind of loop back to, um, we were talking about ANNPEs. I'd like to talk now about FCEs or FCEMs. Uh, this is where a piece of cartilage blocks blood flow. It's adult large breed dogs, but also miniature schnauzers and shelties not painful, usually acute to subacute. Um, usually after running, I've seen this more in agility dogs in the last five years than any other dogs. Good return to function um, chances, usually T3, L3. No meds. This is not putting on Pred or Meloxicam or anything else going to help this. Rehab is what helps this. Moving from the CNS to the PNS, what's some common degenerative developmental stuff. GALP. We used to just call this LARPAR, but now it's really GALP. It's geriatric onset laryngeal paralysis and polyneuropathy. It is a chronic axonal degeneration. The first thing you will hear in these dogs is their voice sounds like they're going through puberty. They have this deep baritone bark, and all of a sudden they start barking like this, and it's really high-pitched, or it's weak. That's what you're going to see before you see the summertime LARPAR incident in respiratory distress. Interestingly, it attacks two nerves for the most part. First, and they're the longest nerves of the body, the recurrent laryngeal and the sciatic. Therefore, they may not affect both of them equally at the same time, but you have to start looking for hind end weakness. And this is, this is a sciatic neuropathy. It can look like, but is not LS disease. Okay, but you have to start looking at these and working through these. The LARPAR side, right? You have to do a laryngeal exam, um, rehab therapy before and after. You can do surgery as a salvage procedure with these. This is what your normal larynx should look like and then look how it collapsed it is. You have to be careful with these post rehab because you are gonna do a tie back and they're gonna be at risk for aspiration in your underwater treadmill, but you can help them, okay? Show me where this dog has any laryngeal function. And this is an ultra short video. I'll put it on repeat. Okay. This dog is collapsed. There is this dog is trying to breathe through a drink stir and not a wide open airway. Okay? And this dog is in full respiratory distress. We got this for two seconds before we intubated this dog and he got an emergency tie back and he did great. Okay. What other degenerative stuff do we see peripherally? Interestingly, dancing Doberman disease. Um, they prefer to sit than stand. Um, their front legs are completely fine. It is a stagnant, non-progressive, non-painful disease, but they will just hold a leg up when standing. When they're laying down, it'll extend. It's the weirdest thing in the world. And then they stand up and they walk around like they've blown their entire cruciate. You can also get distal denervating disease. It's very common in the UK and absolutely nowhere else. So that's good. Um, excellent prognosis too. We have no idea what causes it, but there's gotta be something hiding in the UK environment that does. You can get distal polyneuropathy. 
of Rottweilers. Usually it's a weakness of one side, but it can progress to tetraparesis. You need a neurologist who does electrodiagnostics to find this. Unfortunately, it's a poor prognosis. Metabolic conditions for PNS, hypothyroidism. And if we let hypothyroidism, true hypothyroidism go unchecked, it can lead to PNS signs, okay? The best part is you put these dogs on thyroxin and get them a little bit of basic rehab and they look like a million bucks. Neoplastic peripheral conditions or PNSTs or peripheral nerve sheath tumors, usually front legs. These dogs are hyper aesthetic to allodynic. They are atrophying. And you'll take films looking for an osteosarc, you won't see it, you'll MRI it, and sometimes you won't see it. But these dogs usually need amputation or radiation. Similarly, on the neoplastic side, but much different, you can get a paraneoplastic neuropathy from any type of cancer. The one to look out for is an insulinoma, okay? So their BGs will bottom out, but they'll still somehow be walking and they won't have all the typical hypoglycemic signs, but they'll be extremely weak, some of it's from the hypoglycemia, some of it's from a true neuropathy. If you find and treat the tumor, the dog gets better. This is a golden retriever who presented to me for acupuncture for a type one or type two disc. Um, we did his neuro exam and he was T3, L3 of all things, but he also had some C, uh, thoracic limb components. It kind of looks C1, C5, it kind of looks C62. This dog had no neck pain and was not on any pain meds when he came to see me. So we were like, well, we should probably get you to advanced imaging, but let's get some blood work since you'd already, um, just to make sure everything else is normal. We took some films, the dog looked great, but the blood work showed a dog walking around with a BG of 25. And I was like, cool, lab error. So I repeated on a glucometer and it was 24, okay? We ran insulin levels. This dog had insulin levels off the scale and we treat, we found it and treated his insulinoma and this polyneuropathy went away in seven days, okay? You can really help these dogs. Inflammatory conditions of the PNS, acquired myasthenia gravis is number one. Acute idiopathic polyradicular neuritis is number two. MG, right, is a neuromuscular junction disease, so it is peripheral. Uh, it can be stiff after exercise, tremors, or weakness. It can do basically whatever it wants. In really nasty cases, they'll go into respiratory paralysis, but that's pretty rare. Um, polyradicular neuritis or coonhound paralysis. If they've in played with a raccoon bite or scratch, or sometimes a vaccine, you can get this, okay? It's a three-week to six-month recovery. You can also get a chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. It's an unknown cause, but it will fairly decently respond to steroids. For life, though, they usually can't taper them off or taper them to stop, at least. You may get low doses. Trigeminal neuritis is a sudden onset of jaw paralysis where they can't close the mouth and they'll have trouble swallowing. They do need rehab, and you can really work well with these dogs on building back their masseter muscles and helping them. Idiopathic facial paralysis, breeds that do it, they can't blink, they're drooping ears with a droopy upper lip, okay? Uh, and tick paralysis, as it's still warm out, keep make sure that your pets and your patients are all on year-round tick prevention. If you don't find the tick, that's, the signs don't resolve, okay? So shave the dog, look in every crevice. I've pulled tick paralysis, uh, dogs with tick paralysis, I've pulled ticks out of middle, uh, not middle ears, but deep in the external ear canal. We pulled one out of the prepuce of a dog. Don't ask me how it got there, but we just kept looking, okay? Keep looking until you find the tick. Traumatic conditions, brachial plexus avulsion for the thoracic limb can be from fractures, can be from hit by cars, um, can be all sorts of things. You have to look for it. Sciatic nerve damage. This is why we don't do IM injections in the caudal thigh, so we don't inject the sciatic. But you can also see this with fractures and femur fracture repairs. If you have a migrating intramedullary pin or a screw by the, by the greater trochanter, you can absolutely impair the sciatic nerve. You can also get ischemic myoneuropathy. So you get blood clots that cause damage to the nerves and muscles. 
You can see it in hypothyroid or Cushing's or renal acute failures. I actually just had one this week um, that was a Labrador that presented with a septic arthritis of his elbow, secondary to a chronic UTI. So we got a septic um, arthritis, hit a raging UTI, and then he threw a clot of crud from his sepsis and knocked out his back legs. He's getting better. He's on Plavix and he'll be better, but these are challenging cases, but they're, they're rewarding. So I whiz through these because I really want to focus on what do you do? You have to do a complete physical exam. You do a rectal, a TPR, you lesion localize, you get your anatomic diagnosis, and then go get your minimum database. CBC, CAM, UA, big complete thyroid panel, not just a T4, and maybe you do some tick testing depending on what you find. And please, right, ERs are swamped, GPs are swamped, everyone is swamped. Get some survey rads because, yeah, it would be nice if they can go in and get in through neuro and get an MRI, but look at how many things you can diagnose off of plain films, okay? So if you're in, that you have those capabilities, get that done. It can be a huge lifesaver for these patients and time saver too. What else do we do? Treat for pain, stabilize them, have honest conversations with the owners about things and then get in touch with your local neurologist, okay? We may talk about some advanced imaging or things like that. And then once they figure it out and get it moving, they're going to punt it back to rehab. So with that in mind, right, one of the things I love as a rehab modality is pulsed electromagnetic field or PEMF, okay? This is what's produced by like an old TV. It looks like a TV antenna. It's actually safer than a thousand cell phone batteries. Um, and it works through upregulating nitric oxide. Okay, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. It's an electromagnetic field generator, okay? And what that winds up doing is in both the human and the veterinary literature is an anti-inflammatory and pain reduction um, through different mechanisms of action. The Assisi loop is an example of a total, uh, uh, sorry, pulse electromagnetic field device. Uh, and what it does is it, up, it modulates nitric oxide for healing, and it winds up delivering a signal to the largest dose of those signaling pathways, right? Those targeted, right, TPEMF, targeted pulsed electromagnetic field, signals the body to combat inflammation, and it can use to then increase blood flow to an area and reduction of pain and inflammation. It also modulates cytokines and growth factors, okay? The benefit to the patient is it's this little loop, okay, there's a lithium ion battery here, okay? And you turn it on and you radiate a field of electromagnetic field up and down the leg or up and down the target area, okay? So it's something I really have a lot of owners do at home, although I will do it in the clinic as well. What contraindications are there? Pacemakers. So if the dog has a pacemaker, can't use it, right? Because if the pacemaker is within 12 inches of the electromagnetic field device, it can alter or turn off the pacemaker. This also holds true for your owner. So you have to ask them, hey, do you have a pacemaker? Okay, you can still use this, but you have to keep 12 inches away from the device while it's on. What research do we have? This was a double-blind placebo-control randomized trial of people with NEOA that showed that this was a helpful, effective device for NEOA in people which was really cool. AMC did a really nice study about dogs going through hemilaminectomies and they had a control group and a treatment group and they were blinded. And what they found was the nurses in the ICU for the dogs that had um, the treatment device, they needed less injectable opioids. And the owners found that they needed to give less oral pain meds and that those dogs had a little bit faster return to function. This is not to say that it's a mandate to treatment, but this is a one study that makes a good case to using it as part of a complete treatment field here with a hemi lamb and surgery and, and everything else. So what does it look like, okay? When I first met them, they're like, oh, you, you have this device and it looks, it emits a field in both directions that it kind of, you don't see the field or hear the field, but 
the field in mitts and it kind of looks like a football. And I said, that's cool, but I'm in vet med and I'm a nerd and this looks like a whipworm egg to me, okay? But again, you have this coil and originally pulse electromagnetic field was designed in the 70s to help with bone healing and the devices were huge, okay? And you had to be hooked up to them for hours, okay? As the technology got better, they were used in women going through breast cancer surgery. And they found that the women had better mobility, less pain, and less scarring, okay? The treatment times are now down to 15 minutes, a couple of times a day. And what I also like about this is they can be applied to your TPLO plates if you're using them in ortho too. But they can also be applied over bandages, casting material, and bedding. So as long as it's not you know, a pacemaker, you can do this over a wound, over a splint, over a lot of different things and still get an effective treatment to the tissues. In fact, how far does the device put out that treatment field? The 20 centimeter loop goes 10 inches in each direction. And there's a little sensor that they can get for you. You can buy and you go show how far the field is emitting out, which is really cool. I like to stick the dachshunds through them, right? Because now I can radiate that field all, all the way up to T3 and all the way down to L7S1. So this is where I like to use it the most. Um, we send a lot of our neuro patients home with these. Um, we'll also do them for brachial plexus avulsions. We'll do them for, we just sent one home today for a, a, a dog who had a mast cell tumor removed because we can't laser over that site until we get uh, margins back, but I can send them over with an assist loop because it's actually not contraindicated over neoplasia, I think, except for hemangiosarcoma. So a lot of my neuro patients, whether they're cervical or thoracolumbar, will have the owners do this at home because it's a nice adjunct piece with them, and it's super simple. They even took the technology and with a slightly different wavelength of the EM field, can actually target the amygdala and use that to treat anxiety, which is super cool as well. They also make it so you have a patient you're like, oh, I have to treat like five spots. No, you don't. You don't have to do it five times for 15 minutes each. They make a bed device that has four loops in it that radiates up. And so you could treat the whole patient um, in one treatment as well. I've used these for years. They're one of my easy, straightforward go-tos that I really like having in the clinic. I really like having the owners being part of the engagement because they don't have to fight the animal for pills. I like that they can be used over implants. I adore, it makes me feel so good to be able to help my oncology patients. That I can give them something to go and use. I'm not worried about margins and stuff. Uh, we can get some anti-inflammatory relief for those that can't take NSAIDs. I can safely use this over growth plates. So you have a puppy with a fracture. Here's a nice way to help treat their pain. Get about 150 15 minute treatments per loop. Sorry about the slides. You get 150 15 minute treatments per loop. The average cost of the loop, this is a little outdated, maybe about $280 to $300, so about $2 a treatment for a client. But the rechargeable beds have over 6,000 treatments. And they're about $1,400, $1,800. So they're dirt, you know, the treatment time is a lot cheaper. What I do is not everybody responds to it, right? I'll send them home with a loop. If that's all I need for a couple of weeks or a month or two, super. If it's something I'm going to be using chronically for months at a time and they respond to it, I recommend getting the bed because it's just more cost effective for the owners. I realize I whiz through a lot. For those of you that have to run, here is my direct email. However, I am here and I will stay until anybody finishes asking any questions you guys want. So throw them in the chat, reach out to the cool folks at Zoomedica. Um, I'm gonna see if I have the slide to put up for the discount. If not, um, I know that the team from Zoomedica will get it out to you. And I really wanna thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules. So I am here and I will answer as much as I can for you guys. If you have to run, I appreciate your time. Have a good night. Uh, Linda, I can't have, I can't figure out how to make you talk, but if you have your hand raised, if you want to ask a question, please feel free to throw it in the chat.
All right. So Katie said, can you tell me more about the infectious causes of neurosymptoms in puppies? Um, you know, these guys can start with, they can get Neospora in the womb. They can get Toxo. Um, so it's, they're going to come in, they're going to be stiff-legged. They're going to have trouble walking. Um, you're going to want to get titers on them. Um, there's a couple of good reads on those in like the five minute vet consult, as well as the Dewey and DaCosta neuro textbook that I would go tackle. That's a really good way to, to go after it a bit. Um, and then you get your Toxo and Neospora titers and you can put them on Clinda for Toxo um, and put some things together. Thanks, Patty. Reach out to me. Hope you guys and Todd and everybody are doing awesome upstate. I don't see any other questions. Oh, wait, here we go. Um, now everybody's just saying thanks. It's good to see everybody. I really appreciate everybody taking time out of their schedules. And I try to present these from a non-neurologist view. Um, but when in doubt, you know, make friends with your local neuro. They're awesome, awesome people. Um, Brianna, so we sell them the loop, okay? So we have one or two that we'll use in the clinic and we'll charge appropriately for that. Um, that we'll use for any, you know, whatever patients need it. But if I'm having the owner do it for two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, whatever, we're selling them the loop. Same thing with the beds. We'll sell them the beds. We usually don't stock them, but Zumedica does a really nice job where we can order them and they'll drop ship them to them. Um, I am using Shockwave for chronic intervertebral disc disease. Um, but I don't do it immediately after hemilaminectomies because we don't want to hit the exposed cord. Hopefully that answered your question, Michael. Um, Julie, LS surgery. Um, talk to the neurosurgeons, okay? Um, I try to use it as a last resort. I want to diagnose them. We may do oral meds or shockwave. Um, and then I'll use it by the time they get to me. We're talking about epidurals. And then I get them into rehab, really focusing on core strength and flexibility, because most of the time, if they have to go to surgery, it is career ending. Um, it's life saving. Don't get me wrong. And if they don't respond to everything else we're doing, I'm all in favor of surgery. But sometimes the dog's mentality doesn't fit with being retired. So I'm saving surgery as a last resort. Um, there's some awesome folks doing surgery for LS. Um, Curtis Dewey in Freeville, New York, um, Mike Koaleski and the neuro team at Tufts. I know has been working on a number of working canines and trying to get them back to job. There's folks up and down the East Coast and throughout the US and Canada that do really amazing work. But personally, I try to save uh, surgery unless it, if they'll fail epidurals, depending on the case, but especially with the working canine. Um, Camilla, can we use PEMF and electrotherapy at the same time. Um, you could. Um, I think I get better pain relief with PEMF than I do with TENS. Um, so I usually don't do them together. Could we do PEMF and NMES for a lower motor neuron condition? Yeah, what I would do is I would do the NMES first and then I'd have the owner do the PEMF at home. I wouldn't have the two running concurrently. Um, Jane, extra slides. Um, I forget which one I missed. Just shoot me an email with what you guys need and I'll figure out what I need to send you. Cool, so I think everybody, I apologize. I'm gonna see if it's in my email, but I'm not sure if I have the discount code for everybody, but I'm sure the Zomatica team will get it out to you all because they should have all your emails. Um, for registering. Um, so my thanks again for everybody taking time out of their busy schedules. Um, oh, that's awesome. So the if you mention tonight's webinar um, in your contact with Zomedica, they will honor the discount. So that's awesome. Thanks for doing that. Um, and so really a good tight review in just under an hour and I don't see any other questions. Um, so I'm going to call it a night. I'd like to thank everybody again for taking time and attending and asking questions. Um, 
I'm back out on the lecture circuit this year. I'll be out at Fetch in Long Beach in December. Um, so if anybody's out there, come on out to that. So Medica is sponsoring some of my talks there. I'll be at ACVS this year talking about um, stuff as well. So it's always an honor to be out there. And I'll, um, if anybody's looking for more rehab stuff, the IVRPT Rehab Symposium online is this weekend. And the on-site is in Cape Town, South Africa next year. So that is super. I can't wait to be there. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff going around. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, feel free, You have my direct email. Just ask me questions. I'm always happy to jump on stuff. If you're on VIN, I'm on there. And again, my thanks to Nicole Westfall um, and everybody at the team for Zometica for having me with you guys tonight. It is a pleasure as always. Have a good night.